Um, so the topic today um, is quite an unusual one. We like to address um, how it is to feel to gather in the catacombs. For those of us who live in Rome, who visit the catacombs many times, we know that it's an auspicious feeling to go down there where Christians were forced to gather and assemble um, when civil rights were not the norm, at least not until freedom of worship was made possible through the Edict of Milan under Constantine. So while it's not all of our civil rights are, at, are endangered right now, um, some of them are at risk. Um, for those of you that are, are not American, um, you might know that the civil rights can vary from constitution to constitution, that's from nation to nation. In America, I'd just like to, as a preamble, list our civil rights as we know them in America. The first and foremost is the right to privacy. Then we have the right to a, a fair jury trial. Thirdly, we have the right of freedom and worship, freedom of religion and worship. Then we have the right to travel freely. Then we have the right of freedom of speech, followed by the right of, of free from self-incrimination, okay? We're presumed innocent. We have a right to bear arms. We have the right to marry. We have the right to, to free. We have the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures of property. And we have the right of the freedom of press. And there's a few members of the press present today. Um, we have the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishments. Only God's punishments, I imagine, we're not free from. And we have the right to legal counsel. And the last two, we have the right to assemble peacefully and the right to vote. So um, we've chose to focus on the penultimate right, the right of freedom of assembly, the right of, to gather. And as we're gathering here digitally, um, as I was saying, that's quite um, a creative response to our our secluded and isolated existence has ex expanded exponentially across the globe. Um, Father Robert, as a brief introduction, many of you know him, so I don't really need to elaborate much on who he is, but many people don't know that he was an active, um, active in civil rights um, um, defense in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. Now he marched for civil rights, um, which are still valid today. Perhaps he had other ends and purposes in mind of the rights to be applied in, the, in life back then in those revolutionary times. So he's a man, um, not just of a religious background, he act, was quite active politically in terms of civil rights. So I've called him today to lead us in this subject, um, which he has um, at least 50 years experience. He founded the Institute um, almost uh, I guess in, on April 4th was is the birthday 30 years ago. Is that correct, Father Robert? I don't know the day. I know it was in, 1990. Yeah, in the, in the beginning of April. Um, so this year we hope to launch a series of events to celebrate 30 years of our, of our um, existence as an institute. And this is, in my mind, the very first welcoming F Father Robert to a very extraordinary edition of Campus Martians. In Rome, we like to start um, <clears throat> our seminar with a prayer, and you know we've been we've been used to gathering um, in prayer in extraordinary forms. Uh, you know now having gathering for mass in front of the television or on the computer or adoration, also via webcam. Um, I'd like to ask Father Robert to lead us in a very special prayer at this time before we start, and then and he'll be able to speak immediately afterwards. Father Robert. Okay, let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Eternal God, we come to you in, at a bewildering moment in, indeed, in human history. And we know that you are the source of consolation because you are the ultimate destiny of all persons. We pray that in this time we may take into consideration the dignity of every human life and the beauty of your creation. We pray that we may use our minds uh, and our abilities in order to confront this catastrophe, that we may do it with a sense of justice and that the leaders who govern various nations may do it with a particular sense of modesty 
and with the common good of their people at heart. We pray, Lord, for those who suffer, especially at this moment, those who are dying, those who are fearful, and we pray for those who minister to their needs in various ways. All of the responders, the nurses, the doctors, the pastors who put their own lives at risk, which we recognize is not a new experience in the Christian world. So bless us, Lord, and comfort us, sustain us by our faith, and give us wisdom. We render you honor and glory and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Father Robert. The, the um, seminar is all yours now. You have about a half an hour. To okay. Speak about the topic, and then we'll go to question and answer. Well, this is, a, you know, uh, an incredible moment. And, and I, I just begin by reflecting on the fact I'm not much of a technical person. I mean, the fact that I can make a phone call with my iPhone, I'm always grateful for. <laughs> but I have already been on, I don't know, how many conferences like this in the course of the week. And I think one of the things to look for after this whole crisis has subsided, which we pray will happen within uh, a few weeks, uh, that there's going to be a, a real change in the way in which we relate to one another. If, if for no other reason, just the crash course that people of my generation have had in the use of technology. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a reality. Um, I have some theological and some economic and political perspectives uh, that I'd like to share, but I'm really very interested in, in our conversation generally. Um, there was a disturbing um, video that I saw, and it was a, a, a pastor, a, a megachurch pastor, I believe it was in Florida, and it was last Sunday or the Sunday before, in the midst of all this crisis, he got up and there was a packed church. And he said, I don't care what they say. Uh, I want everybody to hug everybody next to them. And there's this scene of people embracing each other and hugging each other and all of that. And I thought that is one response. Now, that's particularly a Protestant response, but there are Catholic responses like that. Uh, you know, people calling up uh, an old priest and asking him to come out and exercise or holy water in the middle of the night. And, you know, these kind of pietistic things that we don't have to worry about disease, that I can't imagine that our Lord would let me get this virus uh, if I'm receiving him in the precious blood. All of these kinds of hyper-spiritualized responses that some people have. Uh, on the other hand, there is the hyper-materialist response that many people might have. Uh, and that is uh, seen uh, right recently in the local hospital uh, that uh, told all ministers that they could not visit uh, the sick and the dying and said even Catholic priests cannot come to bring viaticum to those who are dying. Uh, and I'm just writing a letter today. In fact, when I'm done with this, I'll finish the letter. Uh, pointing out that this is a materialist assumption, that the only uh, solace, the only care that a person can have is that which is rendered by doctors. Uh, that, that a person is just physical and nothing more than that. And this is a very dangerous way uh, of approaching the human condition. Uh, it also, by the way, is a reflection, I think, more broadly on uh, society in general. I don't know, this is gonna vary because we have, I don't know how many countries represented in this conference right now, but uh, certainly in the West, this trend toward a more secularist view of the world, which means that religion and the institution and the ministers of religion uh, no longer have that place where they're- <laughs> Could, could somebody mute that? Because I, I can't hear myself think. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, 
this represents a denigration of the role of religion. And this is uh, with regard to a hospital. With regard to a hospital, this is particularly disingenuous because after all, Michael, can you mute that? Unless those are Michael's children. Thank you. Um, this is particularly disingenuous because of the fact that um, <laughs> Christianity invented the hospital. So it comes from our inspiration, and now we're being excluded from the very institutions that we uh, contribute to the making of. So these are some just general reflections on the crisis uh, as a whole, that we need to approach this thing both with reason and with faith together. And, this is parallel, isn't it, to a lot of what the Acton Institute has been saying over the last 30 years, that we must approach the economy not just as a mathematical challenge, but as a human engagement, and that the human person transcends the economy and should be at the center of the economy, and that this is what gives rise to our understanding of who we are in the world and how we need to relate uh, to one another in the world. And the first response to human vulnerability, I think, needs to come from our churches. This is why I think our, our leaders, our bishops, need to resist the temptation to, in effect, close ourselves down and in on ourselves, but should really now be at the, uh, the front lines of helping uh, human beings in their vulnerable circumstance. Um, I think, too, uh, I'm just thinking about the reality of what happened in Italy. I just read about this priest, I think it was in Bergamo, who gave up uh, his respirator for a young person. Uh, what a model, what an example of uh, the Christian vocation, the priestly vocation. Uh, so these are, are the kind of practical realities we're confronting. Uh, Anyone who has been around the Acton Institute for even a short period of time is very well aware of how we have emphasized time and time again the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity. Uh, and particularly now, subsidiarity comes into play here because we have an opportunity to reflect on the proper role of government and society. Unless you're a full-scale anarchist and don't believe in any government, uh, you believe that there is a government, and justifiably so, but that this government's actions needs to be very circumspect, that the first actors in human need ought to be those closest to them. And when there's a failure at a local level, or when there is some kind of dire crisis, then you go up to larger levels, higher levels, of social organization so that if there's a failure in the family, if there's disease or, or incapacity in the family, that the family members and the extended family should then minister to those who are in need. And then it should broaden itself out so that you go to a municipality, a city, other mediating institutions in society such as churches. In, in our own parish, uh, we have had every parishioner called by other parishioners and have just tried to ascertain what their needs are, uh, whether it's just a conversation or physical needs of uh, food, or if they need somebody uh, running uh, uh, errands for them to go out shopping, things like that. Uh, then a, a state government or, or a, uh, uh, even a central government can act when there are, are needs that transcend what the, the local communities can do. But also as part of the principle of subsidiarity, and I think an equally important part that's very often forgotten, is that those interventions need to be temporary. They should not become normative. They should not be seen as the essential role and the normative role of the state in a society. So that when things recede, when the emergency recedes, they need to pull back. Now the historical record on this point is very sad. There's a book written by Robert Hick, the name being uh, Crisis and Leviathan, 
which studied mm -hmm. over a period of a certain number of years the uh, various crises that have taken place. He doesn't talk about uh, disease and pandemics, but uh, I think the, the principles can apply, that when there's a crisis, the government comes in and introduces certain interventions, which may or may or not have been needed at the time. But nonetheless, when the crisis subsides, the uh, intervention doesn't subside to the same level as it was to begin with. It ratchets its, itself up and so that you have over time an acceptance of more and more intervention into society. So that I know that in Italy right now, there are literally roadblocks. If you go out of your house, you have to have a state authorization in order to go to wherever it is you, you feel that you need to go. Yes, sir. Uh, this becomes very dangerous to society in general, uh, especially when this begins to be accepted as the norm uh, for people. Uh, so this is one of the dangers that's uh, presented to us. Let's also understand that what is needed now, what we are confronting, what fear is in a, to a very great extent, is not knowing or not feeling in control. A child is afraid to walk into a dark room, why? Because the child can't see. And maybe some of us adults are afraid to walk into a room like that too, sometimes. But it's you don't see, you don't know. Something could jump out of the closet at you. Uh, and so fear and the lack of knowledge, the lack of control. And that I think is, uh, on a global level, what's happening right now, we, we simply don't know. I mean, a lot of people think they know. If you read the internet, you have all the answers uh, to the problem of the coronavirus. But in point of fact, we, we don't know a lot about it. It's, it's a new reality. Uh, this is why our bodies are more vulnerable to the disease, because we haven't built up antibodies yet. And what we need now are people who are accumulating knowledge. And what I know, uh, and, and this, by the way, applies not just to the solution to the vaccines and to the treatment for the coronavirus, virus, but for all of the other things that are needed when humans find themselves in vulnerable circumstances. So if you're talking about hand sanitizer or you're talking about face masks or various other things that people need just to live, the, the challenge is to allow the production of those things in a way that doesn't hamper the producers and allows the knowledge of the urgency of those things. I'm talking about prices here. I'm talking about the fact that <coughs> when something is of a, a, a greater need in a particular area, that you need to allow the prices to reflect that if for no other reason than just the information that it gives you about uh, the importance of, of that kind of thing. Uh, moreover, the danger of centralizing a response to a crisis is that the central planners may themselves be mistaken. And if you have only one plan to a crisis, rather than a variety of people working on the pro uh, problem from a variety of perspectives and accumulating knowledge and then sharing that knowledge of how to really confront the thing. If you have just one central uh, organized plan, if you have the World Health Organization making the decisions on this, it obviously becomes very, very dangerous overall. And then to another reason why more local and more personal um, uh, responses are helpful, not only the human dimension, that it's human beings responding to human beings rather than uh, policymakers responding, um, is the fact that there are different needs in different localities. It, it doesn't make any sense to have one broad policy that affects a, a wide swath of people uh, and that that doesn't apply in this circumstance. So that rural areas are going to be affected in a way that's very different from a city. And you need to have people in those respective localities being involved in the response. Uh, so these are, are some of the considerations that need to um, be brought to bear on this question. And then, uh, and finally, and I'm gonna kind of close with this, very often I've heard when we speak about these things, especially 
a lot of us on this call are academicians in one way or another. We're used to kind of confronting things based on our knowledge, our reason, our research. And people will often, you've probably heard this said to you, oh, those are nice ideas, but they don't meet the practical needs of people. They don't meet what we need as human beings. And they don't have a practical application. Well, let me offer some practical applications. Rather than presuming that what we need right now is a great deal of intervention, we certainly need some coordination. That's really definitely, it seems to me, the proper role of the government to coordinate things in various places and where there is a manifest need to, to act if there aren't other actors to act. But what if we also brought to the equation the advantage of various regulations being relaxed? Now, I know I'm speaking to a broadly international audience, so regulatory or licensing procedures, but generally speaking, our societies are highly governed by licensing laws that say that a person cannot practice medicine unless he or she has a degree from a particular medical school or something like that. And further, that you can only practice medicine in your locality, so that in, your, in the United States, uh, a doctor who is certified to act as a medical doctor in one state can't necessarily act as a medical doctor or as a nurse in an adjacent state. What if we begin dropping those regulations and say where there are needs, you may need more doctors over in one state than you do in another at a given time or nurses. What if we relax some of those regulatory laws or what if, and I know, by the way, in Italy, the role of the pharmacist is far greater than in the United States. A pharmacist in, uh, uh, in the United States is very restricted in what they can do to help a person who comes in with a cold or the flu or, or even something in their eye. They're very restricted. Uh, in Italy, it seemed to me that the pharmacist has a more definite role and can even, if I, I may be mistaken in this, can even give you a more powerful medication than a pharmacist in the United States can give. Uh, what, what if we allow other people, nurses, to prescribe medication, to act in areas that they have certain competencies for? In other words, look at how we've restricted and constricted the ability of people to serve other people simply because we have legislation uh, and, and all kinds of other political interests, by the way, that are involved in that because a lot of these um, medical schools are interested in keeping the number of doctors down so that they can increase the amount of salary that they can demand from uh, various people in their service. So this is one thing. This, how do I learn this? I see unions doing this all the time. And uh, medical associations are forms of unions and forms of licensure. They're the ones who bring these up, uh, these kinds of things up to politicians. Uh, and then what if we had a tax holiday? We, we say we want businesses to be pr pr producing things, or we recognize that people have certain financial needs now. Uh, a lot of us can't work. A lot of people aren't able to receive salaries or if they're fortunate enough to work, maybe they've had reductions in their time or in their salary. What if we say to those people, look, you don't have to pay back taxes for the end of the year. Hotels are, are being affected by this. You know, you, you, you go into a hotel and you pay a, a, an increasing amount of money for the use of the room to the state or to the city or to the tourist board. What if we relax all of those kinds of regulations? This would be a stimulus effect without spending government money, just holding back receiving money, extracting money from people. So there are all kinds of very practical things, a tax holiday, uh, removing regulations and uh, things like that that could stimulate. The last thing we want to do right now is saddle the most productive people in our society, to constrain them. We want them to be more productive, more innovative. And uh, I think these are just some very practical considerations. In addition to all of this, and I go back to the point I was making right at the beginning, 
and the example of this local hospital here in Grand Rapids that has prohibited uh, pastors from visiting the sick and the dying, we need to have a religious sensibility. This is our moment. I'm speaking now to religious leaders, to religious leadership. Uh, this is our moment to offer hope to people hope beyond the immediate circumstance where people are in crisis they need to have a consoling word a word of comfort to them especially uh, if they're dying or uh, have the potential to be infected by this disease so these are the things that i i wanted to say and i would very much be interested in hearing your thoughts uh, on all of this michael i, I don't know how you'll uh, uh, conduct the discussion, but I'll just sit back and, and watch. Okay, let me, am I unmuted now? You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was taking notes while you're talking. Thank you, um, first of all, Father Robert, um, for your lightning discussion. Um, I would just make uh, just a few comments of what um, I learned. Um, you were saying towards the end about um, licensing um, I first started scratching my head and asked, you know, what, what they had to do with the discussion, but I understand that it actually frees us up for more of, of a subsidiary role in society, especially in the sense that subsidiary um, participation in the common good can be perhaps too limited to my own location. For example, if my father, who was a doctor, was licensed to practice in Arizona, and when he, when he uh, retired in, in southern Washington state, he had to retake his boards, retake his license, everything, because it was a non-transferable license. Um, so his participation in the in healthcare um, in his late 60s, as he wanted to continue medicine, was um, greatly inhibited. Um, and that generally brings up the discussion of if we're allowed to um, reduce, if we're reduced to our, our assembly in very kind of micro entities, micro packages, as it were, and mi micro participation, can we really help out a nation and a world that's at grave danger at the moment? And shouldn't everything be freed up so that we can move freely in terms of our, our professional work, our professional associations, and our ultimate professional contribution? Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that or we want to- um, No, that's, I think, uh, no, let's, let's throw it open for discussion. I have a question. Yeah, go yes. ahead, Joan. Go ahead, Joan. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my the screen. Yeah, introduce uh, yourself, first of all, Joan. Oh, Father Joan Robert. Kingsland. I teach at Regina Postelorum University, um, and, and I teach social doctrine here in Rome. Okay, so I just want to share this article with you all. Um, I translated it with Deep L from the German. Um, so it's what the president of the Polish Bishops' Conference um, said, and I, I'm just, you know, I'm, it's exemplary. He says, um, in view of the recommendations of the Polish health authorities, authorities, that there should not be large crowds, I ask that the number of Sunday masses and churches be increased as much as possible so that a number of believers can participate in the liturgy at, liturgy at the same time in accordance with the guidelines of the health services. So um, that's what I want to share with you all this. Looking at what Poland did, right, and that was the head of the Bishops' Con Conference in Poland. They, um, in Poland, they're celebrating masses from morning to night on Sunday, so as many of the faithful as possible can go. Versus here in Italy, um, in the first decree that shut things down, because it's, it's come, you know, little by little, we were, the, the mass was just thrown in there with, um, recreation and um, sports and cultural events um, and it, I, I'm concerned that there wasn't a recognition of the faith and um, I just yes. wanted to ask your opinion about that about this this it seems to me it's not respecting the differentiation that we need between church and state no, I think you're exactly right, and uh, I'm disappointed at the, I think after this is all over, there's going to be a real, pardon the expression, autopsy done. And I don't think those regions of the world and those bishops' conferences or bishops of the world who reacted uh, uh, in, in a way that tended to close the church 
are going to fare well in the analysis of it. Um, I think by having more masses, you can have less people at any given mass. For, for a week here in Michigan, we had two adjacent dioceses. I could go to a mass in another diocese in 20 minutes from where I live. And they had two different policies. So one had, uh, they allowed people to come to mass and the other shut them down. So of course the people here went there, doubling the number. Uh, well, I don't know if it was double, but you know, increasing the numbers of people there. Um, I have been insistent about leaving the church open. I mean, I'm under the authority of the bishop, so I can only do what he permits me to do. But what I can do is leave the church open and hear confessions. And we've been doing that, and I've been doing a daily podcast. I can't believe that I've been doing that. I mean, I'm learning how this technology works. And I thought that idea, I had read that, that article, uh, I thought that idea of the Polish, uh, the head of the Polish Bishops Conference um, was brilliant. Just increase the number of masses. I had suggested that we have mass on the front door of our church and allow people to come to the parking lot. And we could uh, Facebook stream the Mass to them, and then we were prepared to bring Holy Communion to every car. They didn't even have to get out of the car. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think the way we react to this is going to, you know, if we send the message that we're like everybody else in society, uh, and that we're dispensable, then we're going to be treated that way, as the example of this local hospital uh, exemplifies. I'd like to chime in for a moment just because, uh, for two reasons. This yeah. is right up my wheelhouse, and uh, also I have you're, to leave. So, <laughs> you're introduce yourself, Tom, right? to everybody, okay? Yeah. So, this has been, oh, sorry, what was that, Michael? I apologize. Introduce yourself to everybody, Tom. Yes, hi, Tom Sundrum. I am a canon lawyer of the Archdiocese of Portland and Oregon. Uh, I studied in Rome at Santa Croce. I interned with Acton in 2008, I think. And uh, so, you know, I've I've, I've been giving a lot of thought to this because every single canon lawyer you can name is giving a lot of thought to this. It's pretty much the only thing anyone's talking about right now. Not about whether you're able to cancel all private masses, uh, but about the prudence of doing so. And one of the things that I think, I, I'm seeing a lot of priests comment on it, which is good, you know, we need the perspective. Uh, but part of the difficulty that I am seeing, I've seen multiple chancellors of multiple different dioceses, you know, daily mass goers who acutely feel the lack of the sacrament, who have had to confront this in their own place. Uh, I can think of at least one person who's spoken publicly as uh, Susan Mulherin in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, when you leave the masses open, uh, the result is that like it or not, you do increase vectors, right? Which we might allow, you know, in another situation, in fact, we often have generally even in very contagious illnesses when we knew what made someone contagious and could do something about it. Coronavirus is unique even by ecclesiastical standards because there's no way to actually prevent people from becoming vectors, which makes it kind of a common good concern that isn't usually there. The other problem is that when you leave the masses open, I'm going to wager that at least some of the people in this conversation right now think that the concerns are overblown, right? And I'm going to wager that other people probably don't agree that the concerns are overblown, but maybe you think it should be done differently, and maybe some people agree with them. We're all independent people. In especially uh, various segments of the church which are already natively suspicious of authority, and often for good reason, um, there is a tendency to ignore any kind of concerns. And what has happened that we've seen in various dioceses that delayed on closing masses, and I, I, I still think that we approached it well in Portland initially with dispensing basically everyone but trying to keep it open. What we've seen is that old people get sick and die, you know, in mass, because the old people are still gonna go because they've been Catholic their whole life and they don't have time to learn about this new fancy concern that everyone's talking about. The traditional, the traditional people go because they think that the Eucharist won't get them sick because it's Jesus, right? And I don't say this to be disdainful, but, you know, Father Sirico, I see you nod. You know there are people who are that sure, way. You sure, sure. I alluded to it at so, the beginning. Yeah, there's basically nothing we can do about trying to be even remotely prudent about the situation. So the, what ends up happening is we ended up disbanding uh, the mass obligation 
right? Yes. So, yeah. yes, which, you know, is important because that is a matter of ecclesiastical positive law. You still have to keep only the Sabbath, right? But we got rid of the, the dis or we dispensed the obligation. I think under the circumstances, I wouldn't fault the bishops too much. Yeah, they're going to take a drubbing for it, but in their situation, having to value the natural good that is life, right, you know, it's life. <laughs> Half of these bishops are part of the pro-life movement, right? We have to spend all of our time talking about how important life is to a society that doesn't believe it. And then we spin around, and as soon as there's an epidemic or a bunch of old people who are even less protected in some cases than, you know, children, uh, when a bunch of old people start dying, what is our witness no, in that situation? I, I, don't, I don't think it has to be that polarized. I, I, the reality is that those older people uh, go shopping to, yeah. to, to get food. Now, we've made certain accommodations, at least here. Uh, there are certain times that they can go and get food when other people aren't there so they're not as crowded. So let's offer the mass if they want to come. Again, of course, the first thing is you dispense the obligation. But, but simply closing it down in a way that we don't close down other important services says right. that we're not quite as important as that, that, that yeah. what we offer is not as vital. That it, and, and in fact, you, you emphasized only the medical side of that when you said we're pro-life. Well, we're also pro-life. We're also pro-life. Yeah. yeah. So the, right. uh, all for the prudence, you know, I closed my school and the Acton Institute a day before the governor and the bishops, Closed the, the, the closed the school. So I was on this thing. I understood how serious it was. But on the other hand, I think we can do this in a prudent way. Will there be no risks? No. There, there yeah. are. There, that's not going to exist. But I think I, we're going to we're going to live with this legacy. I want to make one point though, in general, about rights because we did. You did say that. Um, you know, the, I, I understand the concern that it might be approaching this from a materialist or a, or a medicalist, if you want, perspective. I'll just use that word loosely. Sure. There are lots mm -hmm. of ecclesiastical rights that we respect as part of the faith that we acknowledge as fundamental to who we are. They're documented in the code. They are fundamentally things that as Catholics we have to accept our essential baptismal rights, for example. But when you talk about enforcing those in the face of their being unpopular in the state, uh, in, in immediately you end up with things like the Mortara affair. So, okay, okay. bluntly speaking, there are restrictions on how we can exercise even the right yes. to receive yes. sacraments, and some of those have to do with dealing with the state. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I know like, there are other people who want to get in on this discussion. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that, that's all I, I was going to say. Just feel I, free I'd to chime to in right now. You have to unmute if you want to ask a question. They're sending you messages, Michael. Okay. Okay. Pascal. Uh, Pas Pas Father Pascal, there you go. Come on. You got to unmute, say. Father. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay. Introduce yourself, yeah. Father Pascal. Okay. My name is uh, Pascal. I'm. I have been to Acton conference for two years now. I'm currently in Munich, Germany. Yeah. Uh, so just what I want to add to this is to is with regard to just thanking Father Robert Sirico for all he has just said and for for Thomas who I just said made a great con contribution also. Uh, concerning here in Germany, just from a little experience, uh, first of all, I see the polities in this very uh, restriction because uh, just to make it very simple, the politicians also see it as an opportunity to show the kind of strength they have. Yes. Because yes. like in Munich here, the uh, Makusuda, the, the, I think the governor, they call it the Bundes uh, minister. So he met, uh, the, 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 the call it prime minister. So he met his, he met his, uh, uh, his, he met his uh, restrictions known like around eight or nine in the morning. So 
just like around uh, one o'clock or yeah two o'clock in the afternoon it uh, the the archbishop yes the cardinal just made his own uh, uh message known that everything should be just closed down so and people were angry they a lot of people were were angry not that he was so sensible and conscious but they didn't see so much hope they didn't see so much uh you know making it to for them to understand that there is a big risk here but also my brothers and sisters let us also do this giving them other measures he just made it as if like an administrator immediately he got his news he just followed it immediately so people saw it that the politician is showing the kind of extent he can influence even the church because they see the church here as a very strong like uh, bavaria is a very strong catholic uh, region so uh, secondly also after that some other bishops had to come up with uh, uh, better regulations or better ways the priests can celebrate mass like in some like in the diocese of uh, regensburg and then also in some other diocese the priests are allowed to say mass even at that very uh, time that they have been they have been scheduled to celebrate mass but all they were told is to to reduce it or to celebrate even if they are like one or two so that people will be in their homes and also to join in the mass only that they will bring their candles out put it on and then when they hear the bell of the church all they need to do is to put their mind into it and then some bishops even had to come up with a prayer for a uh, prayer for uh, spiritual communion so so i see that also that even if those laws are made but to show the people that there is still hope despite all these things and then bringing more ways that they can still celebrate the mass though from their homes so that they can still have hope in yeah. the church despite yeah. everything so i think this just my little uh, contribution to that. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Yeah, being pastorally innovative is what we have to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. It's, we have a question from Ferdinando from Milan, or the, from the epicenter of the crisis here in Italy. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I, I do teach at a couple of Milan universities technical stuff on interest rate derivatives, Bitcoin and blockchain. And uh, I have a mostly one question and one observation I would love to, to get uh, your opinion about. Uh, first off, uh, I mean, of course, we are allowed to go out shopping to take care of our body. I think we should be allowed to go to mass, to take care of our soul and that's pretty easy i've been complaining about that a lot as much as i could even up to the head of the constitutional court in italy she answered back to me something like it was a private message these are our times people in charge might get things wrong but this is the moment of cooperation so she was suggesting that, like, not to be too picky. Uh, by the way, she's Catholic, and this is a known fact. Um, the only point that I can understand about the limitation of the liturgy is that as long as it is a public um, ceremony, it can damage in a way other people. It helps spread the virus. And so, it's it's at a crucial point where my liberty my freedom can do harm to other people and i must confess um basically i'm lost on that so there's part of me that just don't, doesn't want to give up i mean even the the degree the the law the decree from the government i mean it was badly written so like uh, any re religious ceremony is forbidden 
They don't even say religious ceremony in the public, okay? The way it's worded, even the tele uh, televised mass from empty uh, churches will be forbidden. Now, of course, people are uh, do understand what was the intent of the law and not complain about that, but the letter of the law was so strict to be stupid. And this is the first thing. On the, on the, the second observation is that, I mean, I do not underestimate how much liturgy is essential for a good Christian life, for a good Catholic life. But more than the lack of uh, liturgical uh, opportunities, I'm personally suffering from a resounding silence from the church and from most of our pastors. It's like in very, in a, in a very severe crisis, it seems like the church has very little to say compared to what any public official is saying. And if what he has to say only concern liturgy, I think that in terms of, uh, you know, announcing the gospel, we are losing uh, a huge opportunity. And I, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, on this last point, uh, but I, I would make one uh, caveat. Uh, and that is the silence, as you've described it, is from the official organs of the church. They only are governing and saying what you can do and can't do. The pastoral work that I have seen, I don't know about Italy, I don't know about other places, but in the United States, I have seen so many priests, particularly younger priests, who are familiar with the technology. I mean, even this old guy here, has been every day I reflect on the gospel of the mass and I post it to Facebook and my people are so grateful for that. A, a lot of people, a lot of priests are ministering. I, I know one priest does all of the hours of the office and mass and uh, uh, nighttime reflection. His whole day is spent going back and forth from his chapel and he's got it set up so that you see him doing this. And there are all these priests doing this. So the pastoral work is coming from where it should be coming from, from local priests who are engaged in this question. Those priests who, um, uh, who are looking at this uh, as a day off or a month off, you know, well, what are you going to say? I mean, even if they're in church saying mass begrudgingly, they're not doing people much good. So uh, I think there's going to be a real shift after this. And uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. We have a question now from Milan. By the way, you, Sergio, regarding, the Milan, regarding Milan, I have to say, maybe I'm weird. I did two very strange things in the last week. I went back and read the three chapters on the plague in I Promessi Sposi, which you remember takes place in Milan. Uh, and I think it's even Bergamo is, is mentioned there. Uh, and then I also watched the movie... Um, uh, contagion <laughs> to kind of get myself into the atmosphere of all of this, but that's uh, not very significant. I, I do encourage you to read those chapters in I Promessi Sposi, uh, the 31st, 32nd, 33rd chapter. Also, a wonderful lesson about economics. Huh? If only yeah, oh, the br Italian, brilliant, brilliant. If only the Italian Catholics will learn economics from Manzoni, that will be enough. It, it, you're absolutely right. You, you, the, the famous line in there is where Manzoni says that uh, the politicians, they, it was uh, over the bread shortage, you know, the strike. He said the, the politicians were, to remedy the problem, were putting artificial prices on the price of bread. And he, they reminded him of women of a certain age who thought they could change their age by changing their birth certificate birth date. <laughs> Brilliant. Manzoni, I would have loved to have met him. <laughs> Hello, Michael, Father Sirico. Yes. I'm, I'm, here, I'm here in Baltimore City with my wife. Sorry we don't have a video camera, but thank you very much for our setting this up. It's incredible. 
And I have, um, I'm, a, and I'm a PhD student in history of science at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Nuno. We are from Portugal. Oh, and, great. Uh, Good to meet you, Nuno. Thank you. My question is kind of going in another direction, but I still would like to hear what you think about this on from a free market but common good perspective, which is, of course, it's good that the governments are in a certain way imposing certain laws to make us all safe. But then what, what would you, how would you answer um, questions on this whole injection of money and finance that governments are talking about, certainly in the United States, but also in Europe? Um, from a free market perspective because it's unbalancing everything but it's also want to take care of the common good and the common good of the economy how would you uh, answer uh, this, this this question uh, well I, I would say I, I can't say that I have read all 1400 pages of the uh, the American Congress's uh, 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 intervention in, into this of almost two trillion dollars Right. Uh, so I, I don't know all the details, but I've read enough to know that a lot of these things have nothing to do with this particular crisis. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, or no, at, at the conclusion, I think we could do a lot to stimulate the economy simply by removing the various things that destimulate the economy. In other words, regulatory legislation and uh, high levels of taxation, and, and then taxation not just on businesses, but on individuals uh, as well. So I, I think that is a, a far preferable uh, alternative uh, than, now th there's some people for whom uh, tax break isn't gonna mean anything because they're so poor, they, they occur under the, uh, uh, the economy, so to speak. Uh, for those people, then perhaps you could make a, a prudential case for, a, we call it a, an income tax credit, so that a person would receive a certain amount of money. But this is a real opportunity. When I was watching these politicians, uh, you really have a sense that they are seizing hold of the mechanisms, and they're not easily going to let them go. And I think we're going to be in a very... Uh, deep uh, crisis economically depending on what they do after this and so uh, I think it's better to free the economy to let needs be met rather than this this talk of uh, two trillion dollars being poured into the economy of course thank you so much and and by the way where is it going to be poured from uh, it, it, <laughs> either they're going to print the stuff which means that the money we have in our pockets is going to be worth less or, or they're going to uh, raise our taxes in order to pay it. It, it just doesn't seem to right. me to make sense. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Well, I don't see any questions popping up, but anyone like to ask, we maybe go another five or 10 minutes if you like. Hello, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Father Sereko. Uh, I'm Martin. Yeah. Hello, Hello, Martin. From yeah, I'm joining from Pesh. I'm a student in the University of Pesh. So actually, I really appreciate the conference and what, um, what I'm hearing from the, what I'm following from the conference. So my question here, here in Pesh, but many, I'm a priest, but I'm also a student of University of Pesh here. We have many challenges, especially with regards to students and the, Initially, we used to celebrate for the students and their chaplaincy, but presently, there is no, uh, the students we are told to go home to start their learning from maybe distance education to learn online. So how do we, or how do I get back to them, especially in this type of crisis? Well, you know, this is a, a new thing that we're confronting. Uh, how much different this would be for us if this had happened 20 years ago without this kind of technology, without being able to be in touch with one another in this way? Um, I don't know immediately what the answer to the question that you're proposing is, uh, both because I don't understand technology as well as I would like, and also I don't know the circumstance uh, that, that you and your colleagues are facing. What I would say is, 
is going to be an opportunity to think through how we do credentialing, how we do education, so that we are not impeded by uh, institutions. We've been saying for a long time, this is why Acton has been involved in these kinds of programs that are alternative to university institutions. We provide uh, the same quality, or in some cases, higher quality of academic uh, reflection, but not in the traditional university way. I think this is going to give us an opportunity to think of innovative ways to communicate information, data, research, collaborate with one another by, by means of the technology. So this may be a moment. Uh, I mean, when there's a crisis, uh, there is a great opportunity for innovation. And if I were, if I had a lot of money to invest, I would be invent, investing in conference services like the one we're using now, Zoom. Okay. These kinds of things are going to be the thing of the future. So uh, it's an exciting moment in a way, as sad and as frightening as it is. Thank okay, you, Father Robert. Robert we'll have, um, you, Father. We have uh, three more questions and we'll conclude. Um, the first comes from uh, Mario in Vienna. And then we have a second Mario in Pamplona, Mario Schilar. And then the last uh, from Maria Claudia in Milan. So first we'll go with um, Mario Fantini in Vienna. Okay. Hi, Father Robert. Good to see you. Good How see are you? Michael, everyone. Good to see you? I'm well, thank you. Haven't left the, uh, the building in, in two weeks. <laughs> but it's a crazy time. Listen, very, very quick and simple question. Um, as most of you, like most of you, I'm, I'm pretty allergic to any attempts by governments or regulators to control either supply or demand. And yet we've been seeing these, uh, these this incredible hoarding taking place in different countries, not just the U.S. Huh? The essay that was signed mentions that perhaps we should consider temporary measures to control or to prevent this kind of thing. What do you think? Can it really be implemented just temporarily? Because as you know, once things are created or done, they have this tendency to live on. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think the hoarding is a manifestation of people's fear that the goods won't be available. This is why, uh, and I know this is a very controversial thing to say, this is why I think you let prices uh, rise to meet the demand. A person is going to tend not to hoard as much if it's more expensive. Uh, and uh, I, I think the allocation and the, um, uh, what do we call it, the um, rationing can take place in a more natural way. Uh, and then balancing that with the policies that can be set not by the government, but by businesses themselves. Because a lot of businesses uh, themselves will say, no, you can only have two of these. You can't have 18 of them. Uh, and then in addition to all of that, there are other uh, institutions that can come into play, like the church. Uh, an example of that, uh, I think probably the members of my parish were disproportionately less anxious about obtaining toilet paper. I don't know if you've followed the stories, but in the United States, everybody was concerned about toilet paper. And so people would go out and buy cartons and cartons of toilet paper. In our parish, we sent out word to our parish that because the clu school closed, we had plenty of toilet paper we could make available to our people uh, if you needed it. And other people said, well, we have extra toilet paper too. So our parish had lots of toilet paper. And as a result, only a few people made use of it. So I think there are other social ways in which we can communicate things and stop thinking of the state to be the first to respond uh, to the problem. Obviously, if there is going to be a real problem, then we, uh, you know, then we have to have some kind of regulation. But the risk of doing this and leaving these things in place, now we're going to have the price of milk regulated or the price of bread or the price of eggs. Uh, and then we, we go through and we have the situation that's described in the Promessi Sposi uh, uh, on the bread strike in Milan. That's a great question. Just a little anecdote about, you know, after two weeks of um, captivity, we're, our teenagers are, are literally, you know, fighting over the toilet rolls because <laughs> they, can't, they can't seem to share toilet paper, so they start hiding it. It's true. <laughs> You'll see. Um, anyways, Mario uh, Chilar from Pamplona asked me to read his question because 
his kids, I think, are screaming in the background. <laughs> so he didn't want to unmute. So here he goes, Father. I was wondering if you could reflect upon the lockdown, because as you may know, over the free market movement, there are a lot of people complaining about the future, quote unquote, Sovietization <clears throat> of society. While at the same time, they don't seem to care about the hundreds dying every single day in Italy. Today, 743 died in Italy and another 514 died here in Spain. What do you have to say? Um, well, I, I don't know what the question actually is there. I mean, I could reflect on the tragedy, but are we talking about the, the lockdown? Yeah, he was just what, asking you to reflect on it. Um, yeah, there's no okay. specific question. Just, just a general reflection. And, no, I, I yeah, think... and and that there's a movement towards the Sovietization, as he's saying, kind of the, the kind of yeah. This this is very frightening, um, and uh, you know each country uh, approaches this in a different way. Uh, when I was speaking with you, Michael, uh, you helped me to to see the situation, but we used the same um, uh, the same word for different things. Um, uh, that is, for, for an Italian, what the lockdown means is different than here in the States. We have a lockdown now uh, in the United States, in, in the state of Michigan, but I was able to come to the Institute. I'm doing this and uh, proceeding. Um, uh, my, my greatest fear is that these will become, now that we've had a dry run, you know, uh, that they know how to do this. And uh, this is very frightening. I think we need to have a greater um, complaint about this. This isn't to say we need to run out. I'm happy to stay at home. I, I use seatbelts in my car long before the government mandated I use seatbelts because I think it's a sensible thing. I think it's a sensible thing to be in your home and to stay in your home. Uh, I think that churches and other institutions can be very much involved in this. What I don't want to see is the government to now take this to another level and say, well, we can shut you down when we want to shut you down. This is Venezuela. This is Cuba. Uh, we don't want this to happen. Of course, the, the, the tragedy of these deaths itself uh, tutor us. We learn from this, that this is not a game. Uh, and that uh, we need to be very, very careful, more conscious than we've been before. Okay, so we have now uh, Maria Claudia from Milan. Again, Hello, are you... Father. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. So I wanted just uh, to, to reflect on uh, subsidiarity because subsidiarity, I think, uh, can be uh, not enough right now. In Lombardy, we had... Uh, uh, maybe the best healthcare system in Italy, and our current politicians have completely failed the response to the crisis. They have overcrowded hospitals, uh, the virus has spread in the hospitals, all the hospitals of the region have been converted only for virus patients, so it's a complete mess. We are having dreadful numbers of contagions and of deaths, so it really is a mess. So subsidiarity is a value, of course, for us Catholics, but it must be filled with content. And uh, my question is, um, uh, if you have heard about other uh, models of response to the crisis, particularly in South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, when, where uh, governments are using uh, technology to monitor uh, uh, their people and yeah. they are not against the people because they don't have full lockdown. So right. uh, I don't know what will happen to Italy right now. I, I am really scared by yes. the future I because I don't know if we are locking, uh, lock locking down every uh, uh, productive activity and we have these dreadful numbers uh, and we don't uh, uh, adopt another other measures of containing the virus uh, more effective. Uh, for instance, in Veneto, they are doing uh, like in uh, South Korea. They are monitoring uh, people uh, at home. Doctors are going at home. They are doing a lot, a lot of exams. Uh, so what do you think about these other models, which maybe, I don't know if in the States they are talking about them. 
Um, we're, we're certainly reading uh, all the reports. Let me let me just say first off that I, I you know, I, I'm Italian American, yeah. and I have great uh, great emotion when I read about these things uh, going on. Uh, I, I think the difference in the response on the part of Italy, and even within Italy, as you've just described, between Lombardy and uh, Veneto, um, has to do with a variety of things. First of all, and this is, even to say it is, is to be very obvious, Italy is being affected so dramatically because it's the oldest population uh, in Europe. And so these are the most vulnerable people. And uh, of course, you're going to see the, the numbers climb. Uh, I do think that what South Korea taught us uh, was the importance of monitoring, the importance of testing. The more we can test, the more we'll know. And then we'll know, well, we, this is the approach that we need to take in Lombardy. This is the approach we need to take in Veneto. Uh, and, and in various other parts of the world. So testing, knowing, uh, even just temperature, and as much knowledge as we can gain uh, about the, uh, the onset of this disease. Uh, it is intriguing to me, but I, I'm even reluctant to repeat it because you, you get these rumors and then you don't know whether they're true or not. But if it is true, for example, that uh, one of the first signs is that you lose the sense of taste and smell, then that person needs to confine uh, himself, yeah. herself. Uh, there's so much that we don't know. And this is why I think local responses are better because the local are going to, there's no sense in having one broad response to a thing that doesn't apply in one, one area, uh, but it does apply in another area. So uh, it, it's, um, I think in this case, South Korea is, is a better example of subsidiarity perhaps than yeah. Europe. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm Thank praying you. for you, really. Thank you very much. You need it. Yeah. But our yeah. bishop didn't leave us alone, I can, I can tell you. And the yeah. Archbishop of Milano is always present since Great. day one. Good. He's on the TV. In, we pray with the Pope too. I haven't felt like I was left alone by our Good. bishops and priests. Good. Absolutely. Good. Good. Really. Good. What, what heroic examples, you know, I just read that there are 60 priests who have died. Yes. Uh, yes. In, in, in this so far, uh, aside yes. from the, the one priest who gave up the, uh, the exactly. uh, oxygen. So, yes. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll move to a conclusion unless there, someone has one last question. Anybody? All right, I see. Lots of people are sending me questions, but I don't think they necessarily want to, to ask. Uh, Okay. So, anyways, we um, I see people are logging out already. It's dinner time, and I hear my wife. Um, I actually smell my wife cooking. <laughs> it's moment. good that you can smell. <laughs> yeah, I can smell, so I can taste and smell. So far, so good. Um, just as a last uh, word for myself, um, I've been here in Italy for 21 years, and I've I would. I've had a lot of ups and downs, but this is the, the biggest down of the downs. Um, however, I'm, I'm naturally optimistic. Um, I think we have to be optimistic in this case. Um, you remember that optimism is also contagious, just like uh, an infectious disease. And we stay hopeful and we practice theological hope. That spreads to other people. And above all, it spreads to, to the care workers and ultimately to those who make discoveries like the infectious disease scientists, the medical prevention officers and researchers, and anyone that's studying um, epidemiology, they need our hope. So as my grandmother used to say to me when I was a little kid, she says, Michael, remember despair is the, is the devil's snare and we must not get trapped in a vicious downward spiral of negativity because it actually affects others. So we must do everything possible in our isolation to gather, and to, and, and to send good cheer to everybody and to remind each other that, you know, there's actually solutions on the horizon. They, they have to be. Um, so 
and that's why it's so vital to assemble in creative ways and to encourage those who are who are professionals in the in the discovery sectors to to find solutions and to commend them for their efforts. And having said that, um, thank Father Robert who joined us from afar, but we feel near to you having connected with you on Zoom. Thanks to Thank you. This was, this was a great experience for me too. And uh, I assure you all of my prayers and my solidarity. We have a lot of work to do and we're going to have a lot of work in the future. And uh, we depend upon your collaboration with us. Uh, someone uh, just wrote a note and said, social distancing doesn't mean social disengagement. And this is a proof uh, of that. Right. Thank you, Father. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Pray Thank for you, Father. Thank, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. 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 Thank you